Um, and thank you very much for attending uh, this panel. Um, they say it's the graveyard shift on the end of the second day, but certainly I think that you being here shows the interest that there is in this um, particular discussion. Um, we are essentially going to try and pull back the curtain a little bit in terms of the dynamics that are going on within the region itself um, and the opportunities and challenges for regional economic cooperation. I've got a wonderful panel with me. I'm, I'm very, very pleased. Uh, first of all, to my left is Dr. Hatemal Chamfari. He's the Professor of Economics at Sultan Qaboos University. Um, next to him is Dr. Hassan Al Hassan, who's a research fellow for the Middle East policy at the IISS think tank. Um, next to him, Sheikh Najla Al Qasimi, the Director of Global Affairs at Bahus Dubai Public Policy Center. And certainly, last but not least, uh, Mehran Hajirian, who is the Director of Regional Initiatives at Boards and Bazaar Foundation. Um, I'm Salman Sheikh. I'm the founder and CEO of the Sheikh Group, uh, an organization which has dedicated the last seven years to promote dialogue and mediation in conflict situations um, in the region and to build regional security and cooperation. Again, thank you very much for, for joining. And I think we're all getting together for this conversation at a very interesting moment. Um, we were here last year, but things have changed a lot over that uh, year. We, of course, even before that, had a move towards the escalation and dialogue in the region with the Alola Agreement of January uh, 2021, and then the Baghdad summit process, which was already in swing, and then most recently, of course, the Beijing Agreement of March this year. Uh, that agreement brokered by China, bringing together uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia after uh, undoubted efforts of Oman and Iraq um, as well. So I want to get straight into, uh, into this discussion by first hearing from our participants how they see the region uh, today. Um, Sheikh Najla, I'll come to you first. Um, we have had the Beijing agreement. People are talking about a new dynamic. Undoubtedly, there's more dialogue taking place. Where do you see ourselves right now? Well, uh, I think uh, the Beijing uh, agreement came in a very timely uh, matter uh, or timely uh, situation uh, because of all the development that we start to realize in the world in uh, 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 the development of the uh, nuclear deal which is uh, reached uh, its extent or uh, at least uh, reached a point where uh, uh, finding a solution that will uh, conclude with uh, a decision seems to be uh, uh, halted or uh, 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 delayed for some times. Uh, at the meantime, uh, on the region, uh, we aspire to uh, to at least uh, establish uh, communication with our uh, neighbor in the north, uh, uh, Iran. Uh, I think this is crucial for uh, the region development, for uh, uh, advancing its agenda, uh, to find uh, uh, a reasonable solution to all uh, the concerns of, uh, uh, of the countries uh, uh, on the region. Um, having that uh, in mind, I think that this is, yes, it is appreciated uh, move. Uh, uh, China played uh, a crucial role at this uh, point, but I see it as uh, a beginning, not uh, uh, a conclusion uh, to what uh, we, ha we aspire to, uh, to see in the future. I think this is a good starting point, put us in a uh, talking tear, uh, established uh, a diplomatic uh, relation, uh, and uh, I think there is a lot of issues that need to be discussed in the future. Thank you very much. Similar question to you, Mehran. Where are we? Um, in my opinion, I would put it this way. Um, it's, the region really shifted its um, approach towards Iran, but also regionally, uh, as in the GCC state, uh, since 2019, after the attacks that occurred in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, uh, largely... Uh, pointed to Iran, um, but 
the main shift is because of, um, I would frame it this way, <laughs> the, uh, the tensions that were basically taking over the region in 2017, 2018, 2019 really led to uh, a, a period where the region was really going towards military actions. Um, and um, the regional countries themselves decided to change that approach, particularly with regards to Iran, and to shift from uh, military and conflicts and tensions to uh, direct uh, dialogue and engagement. Uh, so diplomacy really uh, took place in the past two years, leading to this uh, starting point that we are today. But there was a two-year timeline where, uh, as you mentioned, Oman and Iraq were crucial in bringing Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, to talks. But at the same time, Iran and the UAE re-established their uh, full diplomatic ties and economic ties uh, in this timeline. Uh, the same occurred with uh, Kuwait. Uh, and at the same time, we should know that Oman and Qatar and, uh, have had quite uh, uh, amicable relations with Iran in the past three years uh, in tandem to these issues. But we are at a place now where all six GCC states, relatively, uh, maybe uh, Bahrain less, uh, but as, uh, in, in, uh, in addition to Iran and Iraq, are really trying to figure out a way towards a new regional order where economy, uh, the economic interactions uh, could play a major role uh, as opposed to previous uh, years. Thank you very much. So building off that, coming to you, Hassan, um, it's said that actually it's the shifting geopolitics, the fact that the United States is no longer acting as the sole guarantor in the region. And that, that decoupling is what also encouraged this new Iranian government to really want to work with um, the GCC states in particular. Is that how you see it? To a large extent, I think, in a sense, it's the U.S. factor has been a central component and has been a central driving force behind the shifting geopolitical equation in the region. I think that's undeniable, both on the GCC side of things, because I think the 2019 attacks to which uh, Mehran has referred to, and the lack perceived lack of a U.S. response by the Arab Gulf states, um, I think shattered the idea of the U.S. playing the role of comprehensive security guarantor. Uh, and so the U.S. wasn't going to be the provider of, of all the answers. That was no longer feasible from the Gulf side, from the GCC side of things, the Arab Gulf side of things. And I think on the Iranian side, um, there is, I think, a conscious Iranian hedging strategy. Um, this, I think, analogy of a paradigm, uh, pardon, of a pendulum, um, that shifts from what one of our colleagues uh, terms as, front, you know, as the missile approach to the diplomatic approach, meaning that, in a sense, Iran hedges against poor relations with the West by engaging in neighborhood diplomacy. Right? And this is why we've seen the current administration under President Ibrahim Raisi prioritize a neighborhood engagement policy, just as the nuclear uh, diplomatic track sort of collapsed. Um, and uh, it's for the exact same reason that we've seen relations with the GCC, between the GCC and Iran, improve under President uh, Ahmadinejad, right, at the time when Iran's relations with the West were in a particularly poor state. And so, in a sense, Iran hedges against uh, uh, isolation from the West by engaging more seriously with the neighborhood, uh, but then neglects and, and sort of deprioritizes the neighborhood, and if anything, sometimes raises the temperature in the, in the neighborhood when its relations with the West are, uh, are going well. So the point is that we are presently in, a, uh, in the part of the pendulum that is favorable to regional engagement. The question is, when does it swing in the opposite direction? And that's not entirely unforeseeable, uh, especially if we see a different uh, uh, administration, uh, especially a Republican administration, take over next year in the US. If we see a hardening of the US and even European approach towards Iran, uh, as Iran becomes more and more involved in the Ukrainian theater by transferring missiles and UAVs and loitering munitions to the Russians, everyone is watching very closely how Iran will behave following the uh, uh, end of the eight-year uh, restrictions on Iran's ballistic missile uh, program uh, uh, and activities under UN Resolution 231. That 
uh, essentially enshrined the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So the point is that if we see a serious shift in U.S. policy and European policy towards Iran, one of a, a taking a harder line, reprioritizing Iran because of its engagement in Ukraine, if we see a, a new Republican administration, if we see a breakthrough on the nuclear track where Iranian relations with the West, with the U.S., we've recently heard Supreme Leader uh, 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 Khamenei speak about heroic flexibility and indicate that Iran might consider going down a flexible route. So the point is that if we see a change in U.S. policy towards Iran or in Iranian-Western relations, then does that, do we, are, will we sort of be in a new, uh, uh, old new situation where regional relations are once again deprioritized and we go back to the other end of the pendulum where Iranian GCC relations are tense uh, once again? Thank you very much. If I have to, I'll share with you something. I'm 52 years of age and probably as old as some of the states which gained their independence. Um, what, what Hassan is saying is that we're still, in that old, we're still in that old new pendulum. So there are two different poles, diplomacy or, or missiles. But let me ask you, have we actually, are we actually moving and shifting to a different pattern, not that pendulum? It looks like that we are shifting. Uh, unfortunately, it took so long to realize how important the regional cooperation is. And as you have mentioned, one year ago, the situation was quite different. And now there are opportunities presenting themselves to the region. And unlocking this opportunity is going to be tremendous value for all nations involved. Lack of cooperation have resulted in war, conflict, it has been extremely costly and it drained the energy, it drained the resources of the countries involved from Yemen to Iraq to Syria and the result is not anyone would like to reflect on it uh, in any positive way. And This is now seeing Syria coming to the Arab summit, uh, stability more in Iraq, uh, Yemen seems to be getting on the right track of resolving this conflict economic opportunities can definitely kick in and provide the right incentive for this country to go forward. Iran is definitely cornered, desperate, and it's just unfortunate that it took that long for all parties to realize the way forward is to work together rather than working against each other. We cannot be overly optimistic about what happens on the political front. On the economic front, it's going to be slow, especially when you come to state-to-state -to -state, uh, relationship. But with businesses, with individuals, I think the opportunity will be there. A lot of constraints related to the sanctions, a lot of searching that has to be done, and probably invoking the uh, technology, for example, fintech as a mean to overcome some of these obstacles that are uh, constraining any trade flow that is uh, going on currently and trying to make the best out of it. So I see there is definitely a positive momentum happening and an opportunity businesses, individuals, even nations are looking forward to a new phase of cooperating, of working together, of getting the benefit of such stability and peace of mind. I hope this will be translated in not so long in the future, but rather in the near, but this is not going to be easy to deal with. Okay, so let's get into that. So if I was to summarize, we're in a fragile new reality, and there are positive things to think about. We are moving from a phase of de-escalation, maybe to normalization, and we see that in terms through the dialogues that are taking place. And in this, of course, we have the leadership role of Saudi Arabia, in particular, in driving uh, this change. Does this normalization offer a move towards real development? Um, and can, as you've just raised, Dr. Hatton, economic opportunity actually be a further driver of that change? So let's come to, to those questions around economic uh, cooperation and connectivity, Sheikh Najla. Can this act as a pathway? Well, uh, uh, looking into the economic situation, I think uh, 
each country has its own uh, aspiration from this uh, uh, relation. Uh, but I think we uh, at least agree on one uh, issue is that the main important uh, uh, aspect is uh, development, is uh, 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 encourage uh, the economic situation to be improved, including Iran. I mean, under the current situation, I think uh, uh, in Iran, uh, benefit is to have uh, 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 at least an opening uh, from one side to uh, improve its economic uh, current situation. Uh, but if we are going to speak about uh, 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 where are the areas that we need to develop, I think uh, it's different uh, from one country to the other. For example, uh, with the United Arab Emirates, we have very strong, a very old relationship with the Iranian business sector. But of course, this is a historical relationship that maybe didn't, wasn't affected that much by uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, recent sanctions. Uh, but when it comes to investment or direct investment, uh, if it is uh, business to business, uh, of course, there are areas that we need to uh, explore and see the possibility to solve, like, for example, uh, the rules and regulation of, uh, or uh, the terms that uh, these uh, investments will happen. Uh, uh, I'm sure the business sector will demand at least a certain level of stability and guarantee for their, uh, the safety of uh, uh, its business. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, many uh, Gulf region, uh, we have uh, governmental uh, investment. Here, uh, the terms can differentiate a little bit, not too much. I think even the government investment will require a certain level of safety and regulation. Uh, 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 but also, it will require a political solution to some of the regional concern uh, regarding certain uh, matter and it will differentiate between, for example, in Bahrain than it is in uh, United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia. Each country has its own concern with its relation with uh, Iran, and of course, uh, Iran in turn will have its own uh, also its concern. And that. Thank you. So what I'm hearing you say don't necessarily rely on a purely consensual common GCC position, rather. Countries of the states of the GCC do want to push forward on their own um, efforts in terms of building further cooperation, but this sh this can be part of a broader regional. Well, change. unified uh, approach, I think it's a myth. It didn't happen in the in reality. But uh, if we have a similar goal, there is uh, a possibility uh, through the negotiation that we have advancement. Uh, and I think this has happened uh, all over the world. Uh, Thank you. I'll come to you, Hassan. I know you're. A, I know you believe in the theory of gravity, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mr. Newton and the apple. And of course, the elephant or the apple in the room is U.S. sanctions, mm -hmm. also accompanying GCC sanctions um, as well. Is that the biggest obstacle towards even regional efforts? How do you see it? Um, I think it is one of the biggest obstacles. It's not the only one, unfortunately. Um, and I think going back to the way you framed your question initially to, to Sheikh Al-Ajla, can economic cooperation lead and facilitate regional de-escalation? I think my short answer would be no. Um, because I think that confidence, <laughs> economic confidence building measures simply don't work. Uh, and there are two cases that I think illustrate that. In the sense that you can't uh, uh, try and build confidence incrementally using economic measures in the hope that they will lead to a larger political change. Uh, I don't think this approach works. And I think there are two cases to illustrate that. One, the recent de-escalation and deal between the Saudis and the Iranians. There were no preceding confidence-building measures. And economic trade and interdependence and investment is on, it's extremely minimal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. So they're not necessary. Um, and they're not sufficient either, uh, because the Emirati case, the UAE being the first or second largest uh, top trading partner for Iran, hasn't stopped uh, uh, tensions from uh, growing between the two sides, hasn't stopped Iran from engaging in aggressive behavior around Fujairah, for example. 
uh, when Iran saw that as being in its strategic interest to do so, for reasons that may uh, go beyond the bilateral UAE-Iranian relationship. But the point being is that I think uh, relying on confidence-building measures uh, is not a sensible approach in the regional context. The other issue is that, and this goes back to the pendulum analogy, I'm not entirely sure that the pendulum has or will stop swinging anytime soon. If only because the underlying security issues and the underlying security concerns have not yet been resolved. We have a Saudi-Iranian agreement to restore diplomatic relations in a two-month time period. This is not an, this is not an agreement on... Iran placing, you know, this is not an arms control agreement, this is not an agreement on how Iran deals with its non-state uh, uh, partners in the region, uh, militias and non-state armed groups and so on, which are a fundamental part of the GCC threat perception. It says nothing about Iran's ballistic uh, uh, missiles or cruise missiles or UAVs or loitering munition, munitions. Uh, it says nothing about, even about nuclear safety issues and what happens in case uh, there is a leak in Bushehr and so on. So the underlying security concerns, and if anything, actually, uh, we are now watching very closely a potential Russian transfer of Sukhoi 35s to Iran. Um, there, we could very well, in fact, see a regional arms race uh, pick up even further if we are to see significant transfer of Russian military capability to Iran not only in the form of advanced fighters, but also air defense systems. Because that could change, to some extent, the strategic balance of power in the Gulf. So the point is that the underlying security concerns are still unresolved. Uh, CBMs don't really work, and I think US sanctions, of course, are a very big issue, and I think they are going to place uh, uh, very big hurdles against investments and trade, anything beyond the very limited activity that we see in the food and, and, and water sector. So I think my, my main takeaway, my final point, is that we shouldn't count on economic cooperation to lead and to facilitate political de-escalation. I think instead, we should be thinking about how we can use the current political space to improve ordinary people's lives. So in a sense, reverse the causality. So it's not economics facilitating political de-escalation. It's how do you use the current space to create incentive and... and, and to create economic initiatives that can, that can have a tangible impact on ordinary people's lives and that can survive under the worst possible regional sort of political conditions and not require de-escalation and, and, and default. Thank you very much. So you're still forcefully making the case that security and regional politics still trumps any economic uh, driver um, at this point in time. I want to come to you. Iran. Um, and saying this in terms of improving people's lives has been pointed out. We have a new UN Security Council Resolution 2664, which is focusing on uh, a broader definition of humanitarian um, needs, uh, 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 supporting uh, activities which could promise much more licenses and waivers or on sanctions when it comes to dealing um, with Iran. Do you see, actually, that maybe Hassan is being too pessimistic and that there are, actually, there is a more growing space for engaging with Iran? After all, there are already billions of dollars worth of trade between, for example, the UAE um, and Iran. Um, there are sizable communities of, of Iranians who are uh, in Gulf states, particularly in, in the UAE, um, as well as uh, other places. Is there... Uh, is there actually more space than perhaps what Hassan is saying? I definitely think so. Uh, but I will not uh, argue against what you said, but I would just add to it that I, I think uh, economic uh, cooperation or the talks for economic cooperation should move in tandem to these security uh, dialogues that are underway. And it has been that, that way in the past two years as well. Uh, much less on the economic side, but uh, when you mentioned the fact that the UAE uh, faced uh, military attacks by Iran, even though they had uh, much larger economic ties with Iran than any other country in the region, <clears throat> I would say that because of that economic 
relationship that exists between Iran and the UAE, it stopped it from uh, escalating further uh, deterioration of relations between the two countries. So that that is a barrier itself uh, in the larger context of uh, the issue. But going back to the point on uh, economic development in the region, so uh, I don't think anyone disagrees that uh, for Saudi Arabia, the main reason that they wanted to engage Iran and have this agreement was in line with their uh, visions for economic development and the 2030 agenda. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure it's the same uh, for all other GCC states as well. Because again, the realization that a securitized environment uh, in the Persian Gulf will not allow these countries to progress uh, further um, <coughs> in their economic development agendas. But um, there are uh, a lot of uh, barriers on the way to engage in Iran, particularly, and the sanctions are a main uh, hindrance to that. Even though there are uh, a lot of areas that you could find loopholes or waivers or whatnot, as you mentioned with the uh, new resolution, um, the banking sector and all of that is will continue to create problems for uh, engagement with Iran. But there are, again, these loopholes that exist and they should be uh, taken advantage of, uh, particularly with regards to areas, as you mentioned, with the humanitarian area, or these new definitions that were mentioned um, uh, on uh, the food stuff, on, uh, on areas that would basically satisfy basic needs of uh, the populations of these regions. And uh, th those areas could really be explored. Uh, I can Thank you. It's interesting that resolution was also behind the scenes negotiated and supported by the United States. So maybe there is something here to further discuss. Uh, Dr. Hayton, so let's now get into what is possible in this fragile new reality and what, what are the areas um, that you know, could promise greater economic cooperation? I just want to build on what Mehran yeah. was pointing to, is the Vision 2030, that is the main focus of uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And he has said a number of times that Saudi Arabia cannot prosper without its neighboring benefiting from such prosperity. And I think in this new reality, this can extend to Yemen, to Iran, to Iraq, and beyond. Because there is a very strong realization that you cannot be rich and your neighbor can will be poor, and therefore to work together in a tandem way uh, would achieve the result. And I, I, I suspect that this is economic incentive is going to be one of the key drivers of this relationship. And Saudi Arabia being uh, who it is uh, with its uh, mass economic clout, I'm sure they wanted to give very positive signals to this relationship by making commitment over time that will uh, show the Iranians and build the confidence that we require. Uh, there are, along with this, I would say uh, the drive is not just a knee-jerk uh, reaction to a situation that is being evolving globally, uh, geopolitically, but rather strategic. And I can see the Crown Prince is driving this in a very strategic way and making the economic incentive as a key issue to facilitate such trade and such a relationship and to enhance it. Uh, along with this, there are a number of areas in which the uh, cooperation can take place in a very comfortable way. It's already a reality on the ground, for example, in the energy sector. There are a number of oil fields and gas fields that are common between the countries, between Qatar and Iran, between Oman and Iran. And there is a lot that can be done and that can be, again, uh, not restricted by the sanction in many ways. Uh, the experience is already on the ground and we can expand that to uh, energy generally, uh, petrochemicals specifically, and there is a lot that Iran can benefit from as well as the GCC uh, collectively. Uh, the food security is another issue that can cut across between the two uh, trading blocks uh, across the Gulf, and this could be high potential for a lot of work that can be done without antagonizing the issues that can trigger the problem with the sanctions and all. Uh, environmental issues is another way to look at it as a comfortable way to cooperate because we are very much together on this and working together will definitely bring more value and enhance the relationship. Uh, plus what we talked about, logistic, uh, 
the uh, transportation, the infrastructure that can take place. And this, in a way, can be activated through existing institutions like the Islamic Development Bank, where all the countries are party to it. Uh, a little bit of nudging in this direction, especially from the Sheikh group, and engaging with them in a dialogue that can foresee opportunities and just focus the mind and focus the attention of the policymakers can make a lot of difference. Uh, these small steps that is possible, less constrained, and can deliver results, and slowly the momentum will build up. And I, th I think we all realize that when uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is focused on something, he wants to make it success, and he wants to make it big. And I trust with this spirit, uh, things can work and can, wor uh, can work in a very positive way. Thank you very much. Um, incidentally, I'm going to give you all the chance to ask questions because I'm sure some of you think I'm doing a terrible job. So <laughs> I'll ask you. So please start thinking of those questions in, in the last 15 minutes or so that we will have. But just before that, and thank you because you've laid out energy. People talk about also the energy transition, not just petrochemicals, food security, transportation, transit through, com through countries to create these corridors, and also environmental issues. Uh, which are, of course, a, a growing and collective threat for everyone. Um, there, if it's not um, all uniform in terms of just GCC action, uh, there is, of course, the, uh, uh, such initiatives such as the Baghdad summit process. Here, uh, previous Iraqi prime minister and now the current government prime minister, uh, I think with more consensus within Iraq itself, is pushing forward. Um, this idea. Can this actually be a place and a sort of a, a neighborhood hub for where actually cooperation can really take place? I, I throw that open to all of you who would like to go first. Iran? Um, I think it's a very important initiative that was started uh, in 2021 uh, with uh, the first one taking place in Baghdad and last December in Amman, Jordan with the Baghdad Conference for Cooperation and Partnership. And this was an initiative first backed by the EU t through France, uh, but now it's solely an Iraqi initiative. Uh, and it was very imp interesting to hear uh, the Iraqi Prime Minister's speech uh, in December, where his main focus was on regional economic integration. And it seems that this uh, platform that has been created for regional countries that two years ago, they hadn't sat around the same table for more than 10 years, uh, now have an opportunity to really engage. And this platform, from what I'm hearing, is going to present viable pathways for actually engaging countries on uh, different sectors or areas that uh, uh, are possible for cooperation as, at a multilateral level. Yes, and of course we're seeing some possible connectivity of electricity grids through Iraq. Yeah. We're seeing transit routes which take us from the ports uh, to the borders outside the region, such as to Turkey, for example. But it's also important to note that uh, while there are some difficulties with dealing with Iran directly because of the sanctions or whatnot, Iraq itself is playing a role as an arena for co regional cooperation, multilateral cooperation, and that should really be a, one of the primary areas where Iran and Saudi Arabia and the rest of the GCC states could really look into, particularly, for example, developing a segment of the railway or the ports uh, or whatnot uh, are key areas that would really not only help Iraq, which deserves it in the sense that it was key in bringing Iran and Saudi uh, uh, into dialogue, but also because of the situation in the country. Thank you very much. Who else would like to comment on this? And let me also add Yemen here, because again, Yemen, regarding uh, if, if the current trajectory, and let's hope, pray God, that it continues, there will be a massive reconstruction effort there as well. Hassan? Sure. I, I mean, I, I tend to be more uh, skeptical of the feasibility of uh, direct Khaliji GCC investments in Iran. Uh, you know, even if we bracket uh, the issue of U.S. sanctions, um, in terms of rule of law, political stability, and so on, Iran, I think, is a very challenging uh, environment for, for foreign direct investments, uh, including in connectivity infrastructure. I think the Indian, uh, the, the Indian case in Chabahar took more than 20 years to materialize with multiple Indian frustrations. They can't agree now on who's going to build the railways. Is it going to be the Chinese or the Indians and so on? I think was was a case uh, uh, 
uh, that I think is, is quite illustrative and instructive, especially that Indian-Iranian political relations are tend to be better and more stable than Iran-GCC relations. So even without that political risk, uh, that di direct political risk, I think the Indians had a really hard time. So I, I don't think that uh, direct investments are very feasible, but um, I, I think it is possible uh, that the political space that exists, the very fragile political momentum and uh, space that exists because of the present de-escalation, could unlock potentially uh, more GCC aid and investment in Iraq and to a lesser extent Yemen. Um, Iraq has not been a major recipient of Gulf aid since the 1980s. Um, that's partly due to the bilateral legacy, the legacy of the 1991 uh, Gulf War but also because of the Iranian factor. Uh, and so in a sense, if we were to take that factor out of the equation, and if we were to see Iraq become a more uh, conducive environment for foreign direct investments, then we could potentially see an uptick uh, in Gulf investment, but also in Gulf development aid in Iraq. I think that's feasible. In Yemen, uh, of course, Iran is not the only obstacle, but uh, uh, it is one. And if we are to see a more protracted, a more durable truce, uh, with the Houthis, uh, I think again the potential for Gulf aid and investments could be uh, uh, could be a lot stronger. Yemen suffers from a lot of uh, absorption capacity issues. They do not have the institutional capacity and the institutional structures to receive aid and to be able to deploy the aid into their economy. They have two central banks, uh, so, so it's a very difficult uh, uh, situation. But I think in terms of looking at neighborhood stabilization. It is conceivable. There is a shared GCC objective to stabilize Iraq and Yemen. Um, and here I think we could potentially think of collective GCC efforts to set up, uh, 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 just as they did for Egypt back in the 1980s with GOAD, the General Organization for the Development of Egypt. Why not a general organization uh, or a GCC fund for the development of Iraq and Yemen? Uh, and looking at de-escalation with Iran, as potentially removing some of the political risk uh, and barriers to doing uh, more GCC aid and investments in those uh, in those two neighboring countries. I'm, I'm glad we're getting you somewhere <laughs> to be in the middle on this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to, or shall I open it up? Sh uh, actually, actually? If yeah. I may add some uh, a point that I think also, uh, 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 yes, we saw the uh, withdrawal uh, of uh, uh, the American from the scene, but uh, uh, to be frank also, uh, I mean, I don't see uh, that uh, the region will, uh, uh, will be isolated completely from its Western allies. I believe that they will continue, uh, continue in uh, 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 relation uh, to develop, uh, or at, re at least to try to develop uh, its relation to uh, uh, and its connection to the Western allies. Uh, I don't see, for example, the American uh, bases on the region uh, removed completely, which can create a little bit of uh, uh, unease from the Iranian side. But uh, uh, what is important to understand in a future negotiation is that we all have to be uh, adhered to uh, the international law and that we respect uh, uh, sovereign decision for uh, each country and we uh, uh, accept that uh, each country has uh, uh, its right for uh, independence in its uh, uh, internal decision that inter interference and uh, 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 the right to establish its uh, connection or its allies uh, where they see fit. Uh, this is one of the areas that I think it will be a little bit also one of the areas that will continue with this pandolium uh, problem that we have with uh, Iran policy. I yeah, just want to add yeah. something. Uh, uh, I think one of the important things, again, that's happening today is that all regional countries have realized that they, they have to compartmentalize their issues with regards to one another, and that's the key in actually arriving at this success with the Saudi Iran detente. Great, thank you. We have about 10 minutes. Anyone burning to ask a question, please? Okay, I'll come to the ladies first, of course. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my question is directed at the uh, whole panel, so please feel free to pick it up, either one of all. Uh, in light of the uh, clean break document, which the U.S. issued back in 1995, do you foresee any U.S. efforts to probably interfere in the recent rapprochement in the GCC? Thank you very much. And sorry, you're just your name, please. Najla Saud from Saudi Arabia. Very much. And that does speak to a question about what you've already started to address is how is outside support or otherwise for what's going on, uh, how is that so important as a factor, particularly the US? Sir, in the, in the nice green tie. Hi. My name is Samir Safar Ali. I'm a compliance attorney at Baker McKenzie. Uh, based in Dubai, focusing on sanctions amongst uh, other things. Um, speaking from practical experience, what we've seen vis-a-vis -vis Iran and also vis-a-vis -vis the UAE relationship with with Israel and the UAE, UAE Abraham Accords. I mean, when you when you when you the the main thing I'm thinking about is economic isolationism. So when you look at the treaty b between Egypt and Israel, it's a government to government treaty, right? Under leather's peace. Um, same vis-a-vis -vis Jordan, but there is not much economic activity happening there, right, between the two states. Compare that with uh, UAE and Israel, right? There is, there is, you know, immediately the Arab League sanction was uh, on, on, the, on the Israeli boycott was, was lifted by law, and there is even what they're calling beyond business. Level one political, level two economic, level three business, where we can actually start connecting as human beings, cultural interaction, Etc. And it's it's been an um, enlightening experience. Vis-a-vis -vis Iran, this you know, what are your views in terms of how trade can be developed? Because the sanctions is is there to is there to stay unless there's a significant U.S. foreign policy shift, which I do not see happening anytime soon and anytime, especially in light of what's happening domestically in Iran. I mean, for example, if we want to talk about um, um, inter-Gulf cooperation. If we, if we consider as a case study the proposal for an LNG pipeline between Iran and Oman, which was going to be one of the biggest gas projects in the region, uh, it, it, was, it had to come to a halt when the U.S. withdrew from the process. And the re one of the argued reasons about why the JCPOA was not a success is the bottleneck situation. Okay, fantastic, let's do trade. And, and let's do trade in a sanctions compliant manner, not giving fund, doing the due diligence, so that it's not going to IRGC and other entities. The banks are, are, are not willing to do it. Sorry, I took probably more time than I should have, but thank you very much. Well, it'll be good to keep talking to you on this. We've obviously got very good expertise. Thank you. The question right at the back there, and we'll take that probably as the last. Thank you. Oh, sorry, wait. Okay, we'll, we'll do one. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Michelle Chubunga. I'm the CEO of Global Policy House, which is a, a technology firm. But I also work with 54 of our African governments uh, around trade in the African continent of free trade area. I'm just wondering, from a regional perspective, obviously there's a, a strong aspiration to collaborate, but I'm also uh, wondering from the panel what the appetite is like to collaborate with other uh, regions like Africa. Uh, and what your thoughts are around uh, collaboration, because we're certainly looking to, uh, to work with other regions to develop uh, the continent and also support other developments in other regions. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And sir, please. Uh, thank you very much. This is Nabil Ali, uh, doctor. I work for the Islamic Development Bank Group. Uh, doctor Hassan, in your point of Iraq needing DFI, I would say Iraq never needs DFI. They have enough cash. They have enough oil. They just need stability. Uh, my question is, is Iran is the real enemy of the GCC country? Oman been friend with Iran for ages. The late Sultan Qaboos, rahmatullahi alayhi, and the new Sultan, Sultan Aytham, again, they have close relationship and ties with, with Iran. I go to the UAE. There were sanctions. There was a, a, a dis dispute on the three islands. But business continue. Emirates Airlines flies to Tehran. Air Arabia flies to Tehran. Fly Dubai flies to Tehran. Business as usual. So the, the big question I would say from a GCC national, is Iran is the enemy 
of GCC. Or we made Iran, we alienate Iran. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have about four or five minutes, so I will ask you to be very brief, but thank you. We have put those questions on the agenda. I'll start with you this time. Please speak. I, like. I see that even though sanctions is the uh, elephant in the uh, room, uh, it's going to be definitely uh, challenging to walk around it. But I guess uh, China presents itself as a mean to deal with these things and that can facilitate what could not have been facilitated in the past. One of the issues that may arise in the future is a new payment system that may circumvent the current uh, payment system that can facilitate a lot of cash or uh, uh, financial transactions. Uh, so definitely China being there in the, as a mediator, as a broker of the, uh, of the agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran is a new factor, a new kid in the block that has to be factored in. Iran, I look at it as, as uh, not a nation, but a civilization. Like China, like India, it's been there, it did not go away, we have to deal with it, and we have to overcome our fear. Our fear has been really, really problematic in the past, and it cost us a lot. I think it's about time to shift and to change direction and experiment something that is different. Hopefully this will work. I'll make three quick points. Please. One, um, I, unlike Dr. Uh, uh, Hatem, I'm skeptical that the Gulf states, the, the GCC states, will make a decisive move towards de-dollarized trade and will want to use China in order to evade U.S. sanctions. I don't see that happening anytime soon for, for many reasons. So I'm, I'm very skeptical that the GCC states will really want to move into that uh, direction. The second point is we'll be addressing the question from uh, Sheikh Najda as to whether uh, the U.S. will interfere and try and spoil. The U.S. has multiple reasons not to like the deal because of the Chinese involvement, because it takes away coercive diplomatic pressure on Iran to make concessions on the nuclear track, uh, because of the, some of the consequences of the deal, like Syria's readmission back into the Arab League, which might very well have been related to the Saudi-Iran agreement. So yes, the U.S. has, I think, reasons not to like the agreement, but I think it will depend on two things. One, Iran is a nuclear threshold state. How does it move forward on its nuclear program? Does it stay where it currently is? Does it keep pushing the envelope? So what Iran does on the nuclear side, I think, will determine U.S. policy. And two, what Iran does on Russia Ukraine. So if we see an escalation, then we're likely to see uh, a U.S. Uh, and European attempt to scuttle the present de-escalation. Finally, um, is Iran, on the question of whether Iran is the real enemy, I'm not going to make a value judgment on who the real enemy is, but I think what I'm going to say is that there is a common GCC threat perception of Iran. There were six GCC signatures on the letter to the UN calling for an extension of the international arms embargo on Iran 2019. There were GCC statements representing all six members calling out Iran for violating UN Security Council resolutions on Yemen. By, through arms trafficking. Um, and all six GCC member states are part of the TFTC, the Terrorist Financing Targeting Center, that is co-chaired by the US and Saudi Arabia, and that designates Iranian and Iranian-affiliated entities that have to do with the IRGC as terrorist organizations. And so I think there is a common threat perception that comes very clearly, to varying degrees, of course, uh, in some of these. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Sheikh Najla, please address the question on other regions okay. like yes. uh, Well, uh, just to state uh, one uh, point, I think in this panel we have the economic perception and the politics and security. Me and Dr. Hassan is more of a political and uh, uh, security concern, uh, which is more, uh, we see it as more dire. I, a little bit I differentiate with Dr. Hassan is that we can't afford to see uh, Yemen. Uh, or uh, Iran as an enemy, uh, because uh, here we declare that we failed in finding solution on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, our concern. Uh, regarding uh, African countries, uh, I think um, uh, the main concern for uh, the region, uh, actually uh, all, uh, maybe uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar and uh, UAE, 
is actually uh, has good presence on uh, many of the African countries, uh, and uh, there is a lot of opportunity. Uh, but uh, there is a need also to work very closely with different government uh, because of uh, the regulatory uh, need to uh, establish uh, these contacts uh, and to secure uh, 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 the investment. Uh, usually in uh, in most of the Gulf countries, uh, the main investor are uh, a sovereign fund. So uh, it's, uh, but uh, uh, there is a need also to uh, uh, to balance between uh, the political decision and uh, also uh, the benefit from uh, uh, from the investment. Uh, uh, Africa is very promising uh, market for uh, the region. But as I said, uh, there has to be some kind of agreement with the government uh, at this uh, current stage. Uh, there has to be uh, 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 guarantors for uh, uh, such things. Thank you very much. Final word to you. Uh, I would just say, uh, in my opinion, I don't think the GCC states, particularly the UAE, Qatar, or the rest, would really want to circumvent sanctions when it comes to Iran. But there are many loopholes uh, or areas that are not sanctioned that uh, could be explored, and particularly with regard to agriculture or food stuff, uh, but also with logistics and infrastructure. Um, and I think with the agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, all six GCC states, as well as Iraq and Iran, are really considering these areas uh, for engagement. Thank you very much. Uh, well, you've heard, and you've, I think you've heard the pendulum swinging here in terms of how we see it. What we can, I think, all agree, as I said, is that we are in a fragile new reality. Debate is taking place. There are differences, but these are being discussed in various serious ways between governments and at different levels, uh, between experts and within society. And dialogue will continue. And I think the challenge will be to thread the needle and to see how, and this is my own view, how an increasingly confident region, which is uh, with its younger population, is wanting to move forward not just from de-escalation, but to normalization and development in particular. So thank you very much for listening to our wonderful panel, and if we could give them a round of applause. Thank you.